to the cloud. All right, are we good to go, Valeria? Are we good to go? Okay, great. Um, thanks for everyone uh, joining us. Thanks for Valeria for getting the lineup changed at the last moment. And we're ready to go. Okay, Kashir, do you wanna give us just the chief concern, chief complaint, and then Gerardo and I will uh, begin to discuss. Absolutely. This is the story of a 40-year-old woman who presented with left-sided weakness since four hours ago. Okay. Gerardo, what's coming to mind for you? Um, yeah, um, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I just wanted to to say something before we start. I, I don't I don't know if everyone is having the same problem, but the, the screen isn't isn't very projected or, or is it a problem on, on my end? Yeah, I also can't quite see it yet. And I just see a black line. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> Let's try again. Hmm. Maybe um, if somebody else shares the the screen. Can DM. you see it now? Mm -mm. No, oh, that's so weird. Um, I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, um, while we get that sorted out, just maybe since we have yeah. a little bit of a, a time crunch today and we want to maximize our learning while people sort that out, do just let me know if anyone else needs to be um, co-hosted. In the meantime, Gerardo, do you want to tell us? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. What you're yeah. About? yeah, of, of course, Doctor. Um, yeah, so uh, if I'm if I heard correctly, this is a this is a case of a sixty year old woman that presented with left sided weakness uh, since four hours ago, right? So um, when when I first heard the, this this chief complaint of this patient, it immediately came to my mind and some not to meet miss causes um, that can be very well. Um, suspected in this patient with uh, the, this in this age range and also uh, with this uh, clinical signs that really um, points us to towards um, a possible localization and also we have the time course so it is it is very important for us that um, we t we take uh, this patient very seriously but also we not anchor in just one possibility which uh, the main cause of this presentation would be a uh -huh. stroke. So the next, the the next thing that I would like to, um, to know, um, are obviously the risk factors for this patient presenting like this, and also, um, paying close attention to other clinical signs that can point point us towards another direction. But, um, I I think we, uh, it's safe to say that. Um, in this hi uh, this hyperacute presentation of unilateral weakness, um, has um, um, uh, our main main suspicion sh should be uh, an stroke. And um, so, well, that that is my my initial comment. <clears throat> yeah, perfect, great thoughts as always, Gerardo. Yeah, when we hear what sounds like sudden onset, um, anything right in neurology, um, one of our first thoughts. Um, is stroke. And anything else that can be this sudden? Aside from stroke, again, as you said, we have to we have to acknowledge what comes to mind first, which may end up being quite accurate. But as you said, also keep in mind other possibilities. Anything else that could be this sudden and this vocal in your mind? Yeah. Um, right now, um, I, I don't think I can point towards any specific um, disease that can present this hyper acutely, but uh, yeah, I, I may be <laughs> um, being a little bit um, anchored in the in my That's suspicion. But, um, Good, and anchoring is natural, and as you said, it's just important to be aware of it and to try not to be um, attached to our anchor, although it's um, difficult. 
Um, probably the only other thing I would put out there, again, if it's sudden onset and focal, as we see here, it's unilateral, certainly we would think of stroke. The other possibility is that the patient had an unwitnessed seizure and now has a postictal Todd's paralysis. So sometimes we're called for stroke. The patient looks like they've had a stroke. They have the whole thing, gaze deviation to one side, they're weak on one side, um, and it was sudden. Somebody heard a thump, they fell, and they had a brief seizure. Nobody saw it. The patient was not conscious, and we're finding them in the post ictal um, state. So that's probably those are probably the two main things um, that could happen um, this quickly. And then we we're talking about strokes, so we're presuming the localization is in the central nervous system. I don't think we we said it, but it was implied obviously by saying it was stroke. And if it's unilateral um, and it's weakness only, we don't know. That's all we've heard so far. Gerardo, where would you put the the where would you start thinking about the lesion most likely um, being? Yeah. So if we have left sided weakness, um, and obviously I I'm interpreting that that data that piece of data as the patient having weakness in the in the left hemi uh, hemi phase and also the left upper up um up, upper limb and lower limb. So in that case, in, in being a very uh, compromising um the this territory points points me towards a possible um localization of the um damage of the upper motor neurons in the uh, that can be uh, from the cerebral cortex, the primary motor cortex, all the way down to the to the spinal cord where where the lower motor neurons are. So it could be um, from the um, from a stroke of the territory of the middle cerebral artery, and but it can also be a, an isolated motor weakness that can be presented with a insult to the to subcortical structures like the uh, internal capsule and other structures that can be down there it can even involve the the brain stem uh, although we would uh, and that's where in this part of the localization it's where we um we would point towards um finding other signs that that can lead us to su suspect that and also, I wanted to mention that uh, since we were, um, uh, and now that I remember the 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 stroke mimics that can that uh, that we should consider in our differential, and now that um, I can think of about all other possibilities that could be hypoglycemia. This patient could be, uh, for example, a diabetic patient that took too much medication and the, is presenting with hypoglycemia with a. Um, uh, and and this hypoglycemia is presenting like in a stroke mimic that that could be another possibility, and yeah, and I thank you for for pointing the the thoughts paralysis that yeah I I, I think we uh, th that is a differential that um although we 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 it, it is very linked to the uh, stroke mimics I I had a hard time connecting that but now now I have now now that you pointed it out but, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, great. Yeah, great thoughts. Yeah, so there's our concern for stroke here, and then there are so-called stroke mimics, as you said, some of which are neurologic, some of which um, not neurologic. To, to get um, focal weakness from a systemic insult like hypoglycemia would probably be a little um, atypical. You can get focal seizures or hemichoria with hyperglycemia. Unclear why it's unilateral, but years ago we had a case from our friend and colleague Gabby um, Pucci have a case of hemichoria from hyperglycemia. So this can happen. Um, but hemiparesis, hemiplegia, as we're seeing here from a metabolic cause, probably be pretty atypical. So I think we're probably sticking in the neurologic realm. And as you said, we'd be somewhere along the motor path. And we're going to want to understand, does this involve the face or not? If it involves the face, we're kind of pons and above. If it doesn't involve the face, we could still be in the brain and have a lesion that somehow affected the motor pathways without getting the face fibers. Um, or we could be in the um, spinal cord, though spinal cord infarction is very uncommon and um, sort of getting one-sided symptoms from uh, a spinal cord infarction would also be pretty uncommon. But again, we're sort of anchored on stroke and maybe we're going to hear that there was preceding trauma or some other um, element here to steer us in another direction. So 
at least based on what we have, we think there's something going on along the motor pathway. And as you said, we're also going to understand are there sensory deficits, visual deficits, aphasia. Um, uh, we wouldn't expect because if this is left-sided weakness, we'd be on the right side of the brain unless the patient is not right-handed or is there neglect or other signs that could help us, um, so-called neighborhood signs, figure out where along the motor pathway um, we are. And if it's hyperacute and it's focal, we're probably thinking a stroke or an unwitnessed focal seizure leaving a, uh, a Todd's paralysis. Um, if there was trauma preceding this, of course, that would give us a whole other set of differential diagnoses. If there was trauma, maybe um, not immediately preceding it, but in days, weeks prior, and the patient has a coagulopathy, maybe there's an expanding uh, subdural, but that would probably be less sudden than this sounds uh, like it was. Okay, so we're going to be curious to hear, was this truly sudden or was it just kind of noticed four hours ago and maybe had been evolving for some time? We're going to want to understand where the weakness is, at least for the patient's perspective. Of course, we'll examine them and whether there are any other uh, concerns to go along with it that would help localize, such as visual, somatosensory, uh, cognitive um, deficits. Okay, great discussion, Gerardo. Um, rich chief concern for us, Hashayar, um, and I think we'll... Um, we could go further if we think this is a stroke. Why is a 48-year-old person um, having a stroke? But before we go down that um, rabbit hole, let's see if uh, Gerardo and I are on the right track to be thinking of stroke before I'm talking more about that element of stroke in a <clears throat> relatively younger uh, patient population. Okay, um, can we hear a little bit more uh, history? Please. Amazing discussion so far. Uh, I'm gonna give you, uh, give you guys a little bit more information. So she presented the, uh, with left-sided weakness uh, four hours ago. It was sudden onset, and the symptoms began suddenly early this morning with, without progression so far. Uh, she also has difficulty in her speech, uh, speech but uh, the difficulty is more of a dysarthria rather than a dysphagia. Like she's conveying meaning, she's using the right words, the sounds are not coming out right. Uh, she has no dysphagia, no uh, vertigo, no diplopia, no dysphonia, and there's no blurred vision, and no nausea or vomiting. She also presented uh, with right-sided weakness four months ago, similar in how it started, and that episode also included a facial paresis and dysarthria. Four months ago, she went to another hospital, and she has had recurrent attacks of the same symptoms uh, during this four-month process, always going to the same hospital, but now she has come to us. Uh, during these episodes that she has been experiencing in the past four months, symptoms have always resolved themselves within a day. Her only past medical history besides what I just described is a history of hypertension, she is right-handed and a stay-at-home mom with three kids. There is no history of abortions, and her method of con contraception is withdrawal. She has no history of smoking, alcohol, or other illicit dr drug use. And her only family history is that her father died at 52 years old due to complications after a CVA. Her medications, I, I'll put them in the chat, but just to briefly go over them, is she uses aspirin, she, use, she uses uh, amlodipin, plav uh, plavix, valzartan, uh, atrovastatin, pantoprazole, uh, citalopram, and chlorodiazepoxide. I'll put all of them in the chat as well so you guys can see them. And this is our second aliquot. Okay. Wow. All right. Well, um, there's a lot there of interest. Harada, what's jumping out to you? Are you dropping your anchor deeper or are you uh, reeling your anchor up and thinking about where to drop it in another place? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of things now have changed. The clinical picture is more, it, is, it points us towards another direction. So uh, I think that there was a correction of the, of the age of the patient. So a 48 year old woman that presents with a focal neurological weakness and has a history of those uh, similar episodes appearing and then disappearing in a dissemination in time and space. And then um, I, I think my my reasoning points me towards a possible another 
possible cause um, rather than a stroke, although the patient has uh, um, the risk factors for stroke. We, we know that hypertension is a really high uh, risk factor, but I think other other uh, diseases now come into play analyzing the the localization, which is very varied, and the, the time course that now has um, a sort of a, a remitting course. So um, I, I think that um, now we, we can entertain the possibility of this patient having a problem um, in the uh, an immune system problem that can that opens up a uh, very very varied possibilities and the first thing that came to my mind was uh, multiple sclerosis although there are certainly certainly other diseases that could, can come into play and um, I'm I'm also having a hard time um, trying um, establishing a differential that that is broad enough that it's not just immune system and um, problems. That um, one thing that came to my mind was um, the possibility of um, of a problem triggered by um, drugs that can that can also happen uh, because the, the the patient has a long list of drugs and maybe I, I don't think um, the I'm, I I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but um, I I'm not sure if amlodipine is is a drug that is linked to drug induced lupus or or not. I I, I don't remember that well, but that could be a, a possibility that I would entertain due to it may have been a neurological a, um, a neurological presentation. In this patient, like like this type, like multifocal um, deficits due to due to uh, a possible vasculitis, vasculitis, um, cerebral vasculitis is also another another uh, possibility that I I would entertain. Aside from that, and yeah, I'm I'm having a little bit of trouble considering uh, broadening my my differential. That those are my my thoughts. Yeah, fantastic. Thoughts again, Gerardo. Um, just to make sure I understand, because there's a lot here. Um, Hasher, did I understand that these episodes there have been several, and that they resolve spontaneously within a day? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um. So great. In the broad brushstrokes, Gerardo, like you said, if you heard of a young person, particularly a young um woman, though men can get multiple sclerosis as well. It's more common in women. That's having lesions disseminated in space and time is the sort of way this um, is disease is described in one sentence. So there's a lot more to say about it. Of course, you might think of multiple sclerosis, but there's a few things here that don't really fit for that. Um, one is how rapidly the symptoms have come on and resolved. So usually an MS flare is not hyper acute. That's why when we talk about time course, some people say acute, subacute, chronic. Um, you've heard me say many times in these sessions that I like to divide acute into hyperacute and acute, where hyperacute is truly sudden, instant, and acute is fast, but not sudden, so over hours and to days, because those really have different differential diagnoses. And MS flares are acute, but not sudden. Um, so the symptoms kind of emerge and evolve over hours to days, and then they um, improve and in many cases resolve um, completely, though not always, um, over weeks, really. So the kind of tempo here, um, again, broad brushstrokes, if you took this as a step one question, heard young person with multiple focal episodes over time, of course, um, we start thinking about multiple sclerosis. But um, these episodes, one, are sort of coming on too quickly and they're resolving too quickly. And two, it sounds like, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Hashir, that all of these episodes have been one-sided weakness. Is that right? Unilateral weakness, every single one, not always left, not always right, but... There's never been an episode of visual problems, bowel bladder disturbances, ataxia, just this um, kind of um, monothematic uh, spell. Is that right? The only additional symptom is the dysarthria. Is the dysarthria. Thank you for including that. Yeah, so MS lesions can be anywhere in the central nervous system, brain, brainstem, cerebellum, spinal cord. Um, however, there are very common MS syndromes, optic neuritis, 
transverse myelitis. So that term is falling a little bit out of favor because um, the myelitis and MS is often not transverse, it's often sort of peripheral within the cord. Um, so optic neuritis, myelitis, and acute cerebellar syndrome, those cerebellar peduncles are very um, rich in juicy white matter, um, which can get demyelinated. Um, and there are others. Um, you could get a lesion of the internal capsule causing dysarthria and hemiparesis. Um, but to have multiple episode, multiple attacks of MS um, that were always hemiparesis and never get any of the classic syndromes, I suppose it would be possible. But that's another thing for me that moves me a little bit away from that. And back to your initial impulse, Gerardo, that this is coming on suddenly and resolving are these vascular events. Um, uh, again, if you frame the case another way, sort of simplify it another way and say, well, this is a person with recurrent neurologic events, what comes back into the differential diagnosis? Again, forgetting that for now that it's hemiparesis, that it's um, uh, left, that it's right. But if you just said a young person with recurrent spells of neurologic symptoms, what, what would be on your differential? Um, sorry, uh, right now, I, I don't think uh, I have that in my illness script aside from, from, the, from the multiple sclerosis. Yeah, good. Okay, good. So let's, um, let's talk through that a little bit. So again, sometimes I find it helpful. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what this is. I have some ideas, but I don't know yet. I don't have a clear sense of what this could be. There are some possibilities, but sometimes when it's, you're having trouble sort of fitting this into a clear box, when you have all the detail, I find it helpful sometimes to just simplify it. That's sort of the art of the problem representation, but to really simplify it. So if you simplify this one way and say, this is a young person with recurrent focal neurologic symptoms, um, that resolve that made Gerardo think appropriately of multiple sclerosis, then you can kind of look a little closer and say, well, you know, the time, the tempo doesn't really fit. Having recurrent hemiparesis doesn't really fit. What if you forget the hemiparesis and say, this is a person with recurrent neurologic spells? You might say, hmm, could these be seizures? Well, seizures with negative symptoms, meaning loss of function rather than positive um, symptoms, such as shaking, jerking, um, tingling, uh, that seems to be a bit of a stretch. Are these all unwitnessed seizures with a postictal state though? That's possible. Again, just taking the idea of recurrent spells and forgetting the details. And the other recurrent condition that we have to think about in neurology that can do many different things is migraine. Now you might say, wait, migraine causing hemiparesis? Well, there is an entity called hemiplegic migraine. It's a genetic uh, syndrome. I think it can either be a calcium channel um, gene uh, mutation or a sodium channel gene mutation, or can be either, but I, I don't recall. Um, and this is pretty uncommon, um, but patients can have recurrent events of hemiplegia during their migraine. Now, we didn't hear about headache. Was there any headache with these spells? Um, share? No. So that makes migraine less likely, though not impossible. I've certainly had patients with recurrent dizziness that we found no clear etiology. We had a history of migraine in the past. We find nothing on MRI, on physical exam, in the opposite order, on physical exam, on MRI, and we treat them as if it was migraine and they get better. Were we really treating migraine or not? I'm not sure. So just in the spirit of recurrent spells. Now, if we really drill down and say our first impulse was that this patient's having a stroke, now they're having multiple stroke-like events. Um, could these be TIAs? Now, why would a patient of this age have recurrent TIAs? Any thoughts, Gerardo? How would that? How would this patient have recurrent TIAs? Um, yeah. So recurrent TIAs share some risk factors with a stroke. With a stroke, although the presentation differs basically in the in the duration of this of these symptoms, right? Uh, less than twenty four hours. Although most patients have um, just a couple of hours or a couple of minutes of of, of these deficits and. Uh, um, this in this age range, we can consider some prothrombotic um, states that can predispose a patient to have um, the, to have uh, this type these types of vascular events that resolve. So, a uh, prothrombotic state in a in a patient with hypertension and um, and um, some other risk factors um, that, that this patient has um, 
could be, for example, um, well, the, there is a, a broad list of, uh, of things, but um, the things that come to my mind are, for example, antiphospholipid syndrome that can be linked to multiple thrombotic episodes. Although the that this patient is only having these episodes in the in, in, presumably in the central nervous system, it's kind of I, I don't know doesn't really fit well my 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 illness script for the for the disease. Other prothrombotic states um, could be linked to to the use of some drugs. Although I don't see uh, in the in the medication. Um, drugs that can predispose to prothrombotic states, um, and also, for example, pregnancy can be can can also uh, predispose to to this type of vascular events, um, and yeah, um, th those are my thoughts. <clears throat> yeah, excellent thoughts again, Gerardo. Yeah, we don't really know yet what these are, and I think one important piece of information that I know I'm sure Hashir will tell us at the appropriate time. Um, so we can use it as knowing what these prior events were, presuming we're sort of doing this in the classical morning report format, right? Just using history and exam, but in real life, before you even saw this patient, if they were coming to your emergency room or your clinic, um, well, I guess this is acute symptoms, they're probably coming to the emergency room, you might be able to open their record and say, um, oh, the last time this happened, the imaging was normal, or the last time this happened, this was a stroke, even though the symptoms resolved quickly, it was a small um, stroke. So that's going to be helpful information. If these things keep happening and the patient never ends up having a stroke and has no vascular pathology, no cardiac pathology, because they would get worked up for a TIA every time, a little hard to make these TIAs. And also to get the same TIA over and over again, hemiparesis, 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 right? And never get a retinal TIA, never get a TIA with aphasia, never get, um, you know, a cerebellar TIA, TIA, um, would be a little atypical. And I'm not sure I've talked about th this here, but um, I talk about it a lot with my residents, and I'll take a moment to talk about it. You know, we all learn about TIA, but in my experience, TIA is actually pretty uncommon. And those of you who are in neurology or in the emergency room or are becoming neurologists, see what you think and tell me um, uh, what you make of this. But, you know, the initial concept of TIA was neurologic symptoms corresponding to a vascular territory that resolve within 24 hours with a normal CT scan. And so it was assumed that those patients had a transient occlusion of a cerebral vessel that then resolved and the patient fortunately did not end up having a stroke. Now, once we started using MRI with diffusion weighted imaging, that's a very sensitive sequence. You can even see a stroke the size of the head of a pin. So many patients who have the clinical story of a TI, they say, my arm, I couldn't lift it up. By the time they get to the hospital, they're all better. If the symptoms lasted for a few hours, they actually have a little dot of diffusion restriction on MRI, and we say, actually, you had a stroke. Clinically, they had a TIA, right? But now we call that a stroke because there is a stroke pathophysiologically on a very sensitive test. And those strokes would be too small to see on CT and even on older MRI sequences. So now that we can diagnose small strokes with such precision, we've learned that a lot of these TIAs are actually small strokes. And when you pull those patients out, um, it's very rare in my experience to see someone who has right-sided weakness and aphasia or left-sided weakness um, and has a normal MRI and you end up calling it a TIA. We often get consulted, this patient was dizzy for 20 minutes. Do you think it was a TIA? They were a little confused when they woke up. Maybe their speech was a little slurred, but they didn't have their dentures in. Do you think that was a TIA? A lot of them are very vague. But a real TIA with no stroke on imaging, if the patient has had symptoms for hours that correspond to a vascular territory, they're almost always going to have some evidence that of, of, of a stroke on MRI. There's a paper on this by um, Clay Johnson, S. Claiborne Johnson, I think in JAMA Neurology in the last, um, probably in the last two years, that we should stop using this term TIA. And probably if we had that infinitely sensitive MRI, that there would be no more TIAs, that these are all small strokes. But in my experience, seeing a real one, a real TIA, um, is relatively uncommon, though. Um, so I think it'll be curious. We, I would be very curious to understand these prior events. Was there a signal on the MRI that these were vascular events? She has a lot of vascular risk factors based on the med medicine she's on. She has hyperlipidemia. She has hypertension enough to need two medicines. 
She's on aspirin and Plavix. So either people thought these were TIAs and didn't see anything on MRI and thought she's still having them on aspirin, we better add Plavix. Or somebody saw a stroke, gave her aspirin. Somebody saw a stroke while she was on aspirin and added Plavix, um, clopidogrel. So, um, you know, those would be important considerations. If someone's having recurrent TIAs that are the same TIA on the same side, usually you're going to find a distal stenosis. For example, an MCA stenosis, the patient will only have TIAs in that territory. A patient with carotid stenosis can have any TIA related to that territory. It could be in the ACA, MCA, in the retina. And if this patient has clean vessels, meaning no atherosclerotic disease in the carotids, none in the vertebrals, then we get back to the heart and the aortic arch. Does this patient have atrial fibrillation? Does this patient have um, plaque on the aortic arch? Does this patient have rare things like um, a PFO, which is actually not rare. One in three people have a PFO, although because it's so common, it's hard to know whether it's always related to the stroke um, or not. Does this patient have a much rarer thing like a fibroelastoma or an atrial myxoma, something that's sitting in the heart with a thrombogenic surface, sending things off. Even still, to have this many events in such a short period of months um, is a very striking and uncommon um, presentation and that they're always kind of the same, that they're always dysarthria hemiparesis. There's never aphasia, there's never a retinal event. These are all kind of brain events without cortical signs, no aphasia, no neglect. And as Gerardo said at the beginning, that suggests that they're occurring deep in the brain, for example, in the internal capsule or in the anterior pons to just get the corticospinal tracts. So we're not hearing about numbness, visual loss, cognitive symptoms, et cetera. So I think hemiplegic migraine remains in the differential, though, without headache, that's not a very compelling diagnosis, though it's a very rare disease. And sometimes rare diseases present in rare ways. And maybe we're going to learn that you can have this condition without having headache. Though it would be clearly a diagnosis of exclusion. Each time you have to work this patient up for a stroke, even someone with hemiplegic migraine could have had a stroke. Um, and eventually, if that's the concern, we could end up with genetic testing here to try to prove that. Well, if this patient's having recurrent small strokes in the deep white matter at this age and the father died um, of a stroke, there is there are rare genetic vasculopathies. Um, Catacel comes to mind, cerebral autodominant, autosomal dominant arteriopathy with, oh my goodness, I haven't spelled it out in a long time. The S, the I, and the L with something and probably leukoencephalopathy. What does catacel stand for? Somebody help me out. <laughs> it's rare. I could tell you that gene notch three on chromosome 19, but I forget what it stands for. It shows how our brains work. Catacel is a genetic condition that causes progressive uh, white matter disease. Thank you. With subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. Thank you, Esme, in the chat. Um, catacel, there's caracel, which is a recessive, I think has some other features beyond um, what catacel is there. There's recurrent deep strokes. I believe they often have headache, but not always. And because of these recurrent deep strokes, ultimately develop um, uh, dementia. And as I said, it's a notch three mutation on, I believe, chromosome 19. If someone can um, fact check me on that. Um, these patients have a characteristic leukoencephalopathy, meaning leuco is white, white matter. So white matter disease that extends into the white matter of the anterior temporal lobes is very characteristic of that condition and not really seen in many other um, leukoencephalopathies. I guess that's a possibility. And then sometimes we see these young patients who have stroke or recurrent strokes, and we really look for everything, these genetic arteriopathies, PFO, hypercoagulable state, all the things we can talk more about if this turns out to be a case of stroke in the young, there is a sort of schema for what can cause that. Um, and sometimes in the end, we find nothing. And there is a series from Helsinki, I think from the early 2000s, of about 1,200 patients who had stroke between 10 and four, oh, sorry, between 18 and 49. And the most common cause is just vascular risk factors. And a lot of this patient has a lot of vascular risk factors. So despite being 48 chronologically, um, has sort of um, a lot of vascular risk factor burden and may just be having strokes for that reason. Though I think we can all recall cases of people in their 70s which much, with much worse vascular risk factors um, who are uh, not having this many strokes. I have seen cases like this where it's a young person keeps having strokes, you go through this mega workup and don't find anything and think, maybe this is just your diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. But of course, we would not um, uh, 
rest on that diagnosis until we've done a, a much deeper dive um, diagnostically, particularly in a patient of this age, or a patient who's much older but has no vascular risk factors. So I keep alluding to it, may as well just put it on the table um, quickly. What is the expanded workup for stroke in the young? We've already talked about in any patient with a stroke, you wanna know about their risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, smoking, et cetera. You wanna look at their vessels in the cerebrum and in the neck. So CT angiography or MR angiography to look for any stenosis or other arteriopathy. Um, and you wanna look at the heart, both in terms of heart rhythm, because atrial fibrillation is an important risk factor for stroke and the anatomy of the heart. Does a patient have a very low ejection fraction and therefore is at risk for thrombus formation um, in the ventricle? Does the patient have some type of um, other cardiac uh, lesion? And if you don't find anything there and the patient is young or physiologically young, older with few or no risk factors, then you start looking for things like a PFO and you start looking for things like a hypercoagulable state. Um, sometimes in older people, depending on the symptoms, you start wondering about cancer with Trousseau syndrome um, with a hypercoagulable state of, of cancer. Um, so those are the types of things you might um, consider in a younger person or an older person with few or no risk factors to look for rare um, causes of stroke. Okay, so I think we're interested in the exam. Have these symptoms already gone away or are they still there? And we can uh, assess um, the localization of this particular spell more precisely. And of course, again, even if this patient had a known diagnosis of hemiplegic migraine and comes with this presentation, I think everyone would, with these vascular risk factors, want to make sure that this one is not a hemiplegic migraine and is actually a stroke. These patients end up getting a lot of imaging um, just to make sure, because one of these could end up um, being a stroke. And actually, migraine is an independent um, risk factor uh, for stroke compounded by um, smoking and oral contraceptive use, although the patient's not on oral contraceptives. Uh, here. Um, migraine with aura, I'm sorry, specifically, is uh, um, uh, increases, slightly increases the risk of stroke. Okay, and then I think a big piece of the puzzle here is going to be if the records are available to Hashayar and his colleagues, um, understanding what these prior ones were, or what people thought they were, what workup she's already um, had, and does that help us decide that this current event is something completely new and different, or this looks like it's another breadcrumb along the trail toward a diagnosis of the same thing happening, and we can add it all up and figure out what's going on here. Okay, so Gerardo and I are stumped and intrigued and happy to be in that place because it means we're gonna learn a lot. Um, and we've covered a lot of ground from stroke in the young to genetic stroke uh, syndromes to whether um, TIAs are really as common people think they are in our attempts to make sense of this case. Okay. And hemiplegic migraine is is uh, is 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 in the room as a possibility also. Okay, what happened next, Fashiar? I'm loving this this discussion, and with an eye to the um, to and give you all the exam, the labs, and some of the imaging imagings. But before going there, I'm gonna uh, drop kind of some grenades here. Her symptoms started improving during her stay and were resolved by the next day. Oh, no. CT head and a traveler to our city. Oh. You cut out for a little bit. Oh, oh. oh. Sorry, uh, I was saying that uh, her CT and MRI were negative, and unfortunately, we don't have access to her records because uh, we don't have electronic medical system uh, patient records here. So I'm going to start with the... Oh, well, we, uh, we lost you again. She was non-febrile, uh, oh. Uh, do you guys see me now? Now I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. She was non-febrile with a heart rate of with a heart rate of eighty-two, a blood pressure of one hundred and twenty over eighty, a respiratory rate of twelve. Uh, her general exam is that the patient is awake, alert, and oriented times three. There is no diplopia, blurred vision, no decreased vision acuity. Uh, there is normal. Uh, and conjunctiva, no limb without papilledema, edema, 
eye movements were normal, there is no ptosis. She has normal heart sounds without murmurs, normal breath sounds, no dyspnea, no history of orth or orthopnea or PND. Her abdomen is soft tend and uh, there is no tenderness in her abdomen without organomegaly. Uh, her cranial nerve exam, she has mid-sized and reactive pupils, no nystagmus, eye movements were normal. Uh, she has right-sided uh, facial droop with sparing of the... I forgot the word for the yeah, upper yeah. side of the face. And uh, she has no sensory deficit on the face, no dysphonia, aphasia, but she's dysartric. Uh, her uvula uh, was in midline position. She has no atrophy or hypertrophy on muscles of the extremities. The muscles have normal tone. Her uh, left side force was 3 out of 5, and her si right side was 5 out of 5, forces improving as the day went on. Uh, her pr plantar reflex was uh, up on the left side, down on the other. Her DTRs were uh, 2 plus normal. Her sensory examination, normal response to light, touch, pain, and temperature without sensory level. Uh, she, everything else was, was uh, normal, no skin rash, no tachea, cyanosis. Her white count was uh, 6,700. Her hemoglobin was 12.9. Her palatal count was 279,000. I'll put the data in the chat as well. Her sodium was 135. Her potassium, 3.5. Serum urea was 28. Her creatinine was uh, 1. Glucose 92, calcium 9.2, magnesium 2, ASD 19, ALT 15, uh, alkyl phosphatase 262, her bilirubin total was uh, 0 0.7, albumin 4.5, she was troponin negative, INR of 1, PTT 29, her iron studies were normal, and her Triglycerides were 219, cholesterol 145, LDL 68, HDL 47. She had normal UA, normal urine toxin screening. She had an ESR of 11, CRP of 39.4, ANA 0 0.1, anti-DSDNA 1.2, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein IgG and IgM were negative. Her anti-cardiolipin was negative. Her anti-phospholipid uh, ant antibody was negative as well. And lupus anticoagulant were negative as well so far. Uh, I'm going to put all of these in the chat. I know it was a lot of data. <laughs> and just to round out this aliquot, we also did an initial EKG with a 24-hour EKG halter, which were both normal. Okay, just um, it's a different reporting format of ANA and anti-double-stranded DNA than I think we, um, at least that I'm used to. Are those normal or abnormal, Ashia? Uh, everything was normal. Normal, that's what I thought, just making sure. Perfect. Okay, Gerardo, and you told us a, I think you cut out a little bit, but that a CT scan and an MRI scan were normal also? Yes, okay. So Gerardo, you have this exam, normal labs, and normal imaging. What's going yes. on? So, so what comes to my mind in this case, um, I, I think um, what, what I can interpret the most from this is not um, is that we have a patient with upper motor neuron signs that doesn't that is image negative. So uh, and that that has um, a look um, a focal neurologic deficit that um in the left so in that in that presentation um really it's it's very new to me i i don't i don't really know a specific um a specific entities uh, aside from what you were talking about right because um the 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 migraine that could be causing this this um this presentation um could be i i think it is image negative and and also the the seizures that that can explain this uh, are all 
are also image negative, although the 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 them being just in one one side really con concerns me. Um, uh, um, uh, but I I would keep that possibility. Um, also and also, um, I I think that um upper motor neuron signs that are image negative, um, without this this remitting course. Um, could make us think about problems in the in the neurons itself that could be for example ALS uh, but um, the, I, I don't think there there is a, a subtype of ALS that can present with this this remitting force so I don't know if if we, if we should consider that but yeah the next thing that I would and th that I would start thinking about, and doing my proper research because I, I don't really have that the knowledge um, would be genetic causes the, that you were mentioning because um, they 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 can be image negative and they they and my broad understanding of them is that they affect then the neurons itself the, themselves and and that could be a problem that that, that this patient has. But yeah, uh, this is this case is very intriguing to me. I, I've never seen something like this. <laughs> yeah, um, I really I really appreciate how you came to the I think what's sort of the crux here um, of this case, which is that you've identified that there you actually you've localized the lesion right, but there's no lesion on MRI. You've said there is left sided weakness with I think we heard wasn't there a Babinski on the left side also was there. Yeah, yeah. So there is a Babinski, there's dysarthria. You know where the lesion is, Gerardo, right? Where is this lesion most likely? If you have left-sided weakness with dysarthria, um, facial involvement. Um... Yeah, so left-sided weakness with dysarthria and facial involvement, and that, and the facial involvement is uh, it's with a particular sparing of the upper part of the face, then it is most likely an uh, affecting the upper motor neuron and it could be in the in the primary motor co cortex also but uh, that possibility uh, uh, since we we don't have very a, a lot of cortical deficits it could be down uh, down um uh, uh, more more subcortical in more subcortical structures and i would think um uh, internal capsule, but also uh, I would consider also the the brainstem, and um, due to the the dysarthria the dysarthria that this patient is presenting. So if we are considering the brainstem and we are we are considering facial facial weakness and um and, and the and then the physical examination we have we don't have uh, a deviation of the uvula and the the dysarthria and that this patient is presenting. This this could be um uh and the in the pons I think that that would be my my localization that I I was I would suspect and due to the and the the structures that coordinate the 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 bulbar muscles are mostly present in the in the pons and lower and medulla and yeah then that those are my yeah, perfect. So there's a, 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 a hemiparesis involving the lower face, so upper motor neuron pattern. So we have to be above the level of the facial nucleus in the mid pons. So we're either or anywhere from the right motor cortex to the right um, upper pons, um, and probably not, um, well, not impossible for this. I'm sorry, it's arm and leg. Uh, end face, yeah, probably unlikely to be cortical because that spans two vascular territories, right? MCA and ACA, and this certainly sounds like it's vascular. So probably in the subcortical white matter or the anterior pons, that's where you get the pure motor lacunar syndrome, where you're just getting the corticospinal tract um, in the internal capsule or the anterior pons above the level of the facial nucleus. So you still get an upper motor neuron pattern um, facial weakness. So right, we know exactly where the problem is and the imaging is negative. So that's the crux of this case, right? If there was a stroke there, we would have been finished. 
if the story was unclear of the time course and there was an MS plaque there, we would be finished. If there was a tumor, if there was an abscess, if there was a hemorrhage, but there is nothing. So when our students ask us in neurology, why do we have to learn all this localization? Can't we just get an MRI? Well, first I always say, we have to know what to get an MRI of. If the patient has a peripheral neuropathy and you get an MRI of the brain, that's not gonna help. If the patient has a thoracic myelopathy and you get an MRI of the lumbar spine, you could miss something. I've seen that happen before. Um, or in a case like this, you can say, I know this is a brain problem and there's nothing on the MRI. So that's meaningful, right? The normal MRI with the precise localization that Gerardo told us is meaningful. And now the question is, what does it um, mean, right? Um, we'd wanna know from the MRI if it's truly totally normal. That means none of these other episodes have left a footprint of a prior stroke, of a prior hemorrhage or anything like that. Um, so what could that be? Um, again, uh, recurrent seizures with, um, and the patient's not aware of them and we're just seeing the focal Todd's paralysis that could certainly behave this way that it comes on suddenly, <clears throat> resolves over a day and is imaging negative, but why are they alternating side to side if they're focal seizures? And probably most patients at this age having focal seizures will have a focal lesion to explain that, which this patient also doesn't have on MRI. So I think we're getting into diagnosis of exclusion territory. These sound like strokes, but they're not leaving any footprint of stroke. I think catacel, other arteriopathies um, could um, probably, um, would probably cause a stroke at some point. So one other test that would be helpful here would be vascular imaging. Does this patient have one or more fixed stenoses that when the patient has a low blood pressure or when the patient is hyperventilating and gets some um, vasodilatation and can't, can't compensate appropriately for that? Um, does the patient have transient ischemic events? Um, you can see that in Moya Moya disease, um, which is very uncommon, but can occur where patients have recurrent spells um, from sort of taxing a very tenuous system of a, of a stenosis. And if the MR angiography is normal and there's no clear signs of vasculopathy here, then I think we are maybe in the territory, as you said, Gerardo, of something like hemiplegic migraine without the headache. The only other signal I see here is the CRP, depending on what scale Hashiar and his colleagues are using, looks high to me for this age, although the ESR is kind of unremarkable. I don't know what to do with that because um, there's no other sort of inflammatory syndrome I can think of that would cause recurrent TIAs with no nothing to show for it. So I think we need to see vascular imaging and understand whether there's a vascular lesion that could help us explain this. And if not, um, not sure what other tests we would order. I know some people who would say it's a brain problem and we don't see anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then should we get a lumbar puncture? But I'm not really sure it would be looking for here. I don't know what inflammatory or infectious um, syndrome would be causing um, this clinical picture. So I'd like to know about vascular imaging and if that's normal. I'm starting to wonder about hemiplegic migraine acknowledging, like you heard, or I haven't, uh, have I seen maybe one case? So I don't know enough about the illness script to know with what frequency they can be acephalgic migraines, meaning migraine with no headache. Okay, we have a few minutes left. Hopefully we've timed this well and we're getting to the final aliquot. Was there anything interesting on vascular imaging, Hashiar? Uh, absolutely, I'm gonna give you the vascular imaging now, actually. Okay. So uh, her echo was normal and uh, her carotid uh, Doppler sonography didn't show anything, but CTA, showed a narrow left internal carotid with everything else normal. And uh, I have one piece of information that will reveal the diagnosis, but I think uh, you guys would want to discuss this or should I just go for the diagnosis? Um, the left internal carotid Hashir, was narrowed in the neck or in the head? In the neck. In the neck. And the reason I'm asking is because this patient has vascular risk factors, they can have some carotid narrowing. Um, there we mentioned this possibility of moya moya, very rare disease. That's usually um, the term ICA terminus and or proximal MCA is where you get that narrowing. Now the other question is here is what is the nature of that narrowing? Is it atherosclerotic plaque or is it um, does it look differently than that without giving too much away? Uh, they didn't see any plaques or signs of thrombosis. So no dissection, no plaque, um, just that the artery is narrowed. Um, oh. mm -hmm. 
<laughs> is that is that right? So are we suggesting some type of arteriopathy or something like a fibromuscular dysplasia? But again, the left internal carotid is not going to explain left sided weakness, which is sounds like what the recurrent spell is, except for that one time. So this may be incidental in the setting of her vascular risk factors. Um, I'm not sure I can relate that to the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I think, um, again, this is an instance where you'd say, oh, the left internal carotid, now we have something, but that doesn't explain her <laughs> left-sided weakness. So Gerardo localized us from the beginning and affirmed that on the exam. We still have to explain left-sided weakness and that carotid does not explain it. So I don't know, Gerardo, any, um, I'm kind of now have anchored myself on hemiplegic migraine, but uh, I'm certainly not sure of that. Anything else that's on your list of possibilities here? Yeah, so I, I was entertaining the possibility of this patient having just a vascular problem that doesn't involve the the bas the brain vasculature itself, the inner vasculature, but the outside vasculature. And as someone mentioned, the, the possibility of fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, I don't know if this the this is the the right illness script for that. I was also um considering that. This could be Takayasu arteritis, but I know that this this type of diseases have other other manifestations that we hadn't had, and um, we we haven't heard, and and yeah, uh, problems with the vessel the vessels itself that that would be, um, I I think that that is what where Casajar is pointing us at uh, to, but. It, it, to be honest, I, uh, I don't, I don't think I can fit, um, uh, a specific disease, um, to for this case. Yeah, I agree with you, and I don't think um I can think of another test here that's going to help us. The standard stroke workup or TIA workup would be MRI of the brain, CTA or MRA of the head and neck, cardiac monitoring, echocardiogram, and lipids. Um, and hemoglobin A1C. And we've done that. We haven't really found anything. And since the patient hasn't had a stroke, it's not clear whether doing the additional transesophageal echocardiogram hypercoag workup is going to tell us something. Um, though I would guess in many high resource settings, people would do all of that, but I'm not sure it would have much yield. And much of that has been done here from the hypercoag perspective, and that's been negative. Okay, well, the best I can do with this is hemiplegic migraine, but it's with a low level of uh, certainty, and would this be enough that you've given us to incur the cost of genetic testing for this um, patient? Um, maybe, but we're gonna have to close up in one minute. So take us home, uh, Hashiar. So uh, just to give you the final diagnosis, DSA showed bilateral ICA and uh, M1A1 severe narrowing in favor of Moya Moya disease. Okay. We couldn't confirm with genetic testing because of the high cost, but this is where we ended up. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit for a minute and then we'll have to yield the floor to the next uh, CP solver session. So interesting that this was not seen on the CTA or is the CTA of neck only, Khashir? It was neck and head, but it didn't show the narrowings for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, that's confusing because usually for Moya Moya to be severe enough to cause this, um, symptomatology, you would you would see it on CTA. So that's a little clear, although if the bolus wasn't appropriately timed of contrast, not clear. Okay, so what's what's moya moya? It comes from Japanese for puff of smoke, which is what the angiogram looks like because you have very severe narrowing and then some neovascularization around that that angiographically looks like a puff of smoke. And why do these patients have recurrent TIs? Usually this is actually unilateral. Um, well, I should back up and say this can be a primary genetic condition or it can be secondary to severe vascular risk factors, to radiation-induced vasculopathy. There's a whole list. There's a very nice New England Journal review of this condition um, that talks about primary moya moya and secondary moya moya. Sickle cell disease is on the list for secondary moya moya. And then there are genetic conditions that can have this as part of it. I believe Down syndrome, there's an elevated risk, maybe tuberous sclerosis or neurofibromatosis or both. I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on that, but can primary moya moya, um, moya moya associated with an underlying genetic disease, and then secondary due to vascular risk factors, sickle cell radiation, um, et cetera. 
And what happens is these stenoses are slowly developing and can lead to um, transient uh, ischemic symptoms. Often when patients are exercising, for example, and or hyperventilating in the context of exercise or otherwise, they get some vasodilatation. They can't really compensate for that. And they're sort of stealing from one side of the cerebrovascular um, system to the other. We had a unique patient who we knew had this um, condition who actually developed seizures on the moya moya side, focal seizures, and the seizures required so much vasculature, vascular flow, because seizure is hypermetabolic activity that they were stealing and the patient had a stroke on the non moya moya side. Um, these are very complicated cases. We didn't leave much time <laughs> to get into why this, um, what you would do about this. Um, and there are studies you can do to see how much vascular reserve the patient actually uh, has, sort of like a brain stress test. And then in cases that are very tenuous, very severe stenosis and recurrent events like this or strokes, there are procedures. You can do the, one of the longest words in med medicine, it's um, EDAS, encephalodurangiosynangiomatose. I forget the word. I'm having uh, trouble with long words today. Um, it's EDAS is the abbreviation where they actually open the skull and they lay part of a branch of the external carotid on the meninges and let it neovascularize. Encephaloduro, synangio, something like this. Synangiosis, synangiosis. Anyway, I don't remember. Um, uh, someone, uh, yeah, encephaloduro arteriosynangiosis. Okay, I was close. Um, EDAS is what we call it. These are very dangerous procedures, obviously, to perform very high um, risk, but okay. Um, I don't want to eat into our colleagues' time, which we've already done by five minutes. If you have a one-minute closer here for us, Kashiar, that's great. If the closer was just the shock of moya moya disease, we can leave it at that. Thank you for the great discussion. I really enjoyed the thought process, like we were moving in parallel. And that was amazing. Thank you. Okay, great discussion, Gerardo. Thanks so much for bringing this case, Kashiar. And sorry, we can't go to our usual long uh long extending neuro vmr well into the next hour since we have someone else here but um recommend the new england journal review from a few years ago on moya moya and the clay johnson editorial on whether we should still be using the term tia okay thank you everyone look forward to seeing you next time thank you everyone goodbye